Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dale Black. Good evening and welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce somebody that I would hope that you might help me uh, express a warm meeting to. Uh, that would be, her name is Diane Drexler. She's a, a pillar and support of the PBM program now since the program came to YRMC. Um, she serves as the chief nursing officer. And Diane is going to open up our seminar tonight with some opening comments. So, Diane, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. On behalf of Yavapai Regional Medical Center, I would like to welcome you to the sixth annual Patient Blood Management Symposium. I have some interesting statistics to share with you on the impact that this program has had on our organization. As of September 2018, the use of red blood cells has decreased by 32%. Since the beginning of the program, which is 2012, the use of fresh frozen plasma has decreased by 61%. The overall savings since the program began is over $6 million on red blood cells and $1 million on fresh frozen plasma. So what does this mean? This means that these funds can now be reallocated to new technologies, other programs, and other services to continue to improve the quality of care of our patients and improve outcomes. This benefits both our community and our organization. For those nurses attending this evening, how many nurses do we have out there? All right, we've got, we've got quite a few. We are happy to announce that we are offering two continuing education hours. These are, um, there are instructions at the registration tables on how to receive your certificate upon leaving. Without further ado, I'll turn this over back to Dale to continue the program. Stored blood is aged you don't know exactly how old it is. Autologous blood, or blood that has been recently withdrawn from the patient, is fresh. With autologous blood, you know that you have fresh factors, clotting factors, okay, which are proteins and platelets. You also have fresh red blood cells. The red blood cells are absolutely important in oxygen carrying capacity, and in stored blood, those red blood cells age and they, if you will, die and become less effective at what you need them to do, which is oxygen transport. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Daniel Beck. Good evening. So I, I realize this symposium is about blood, but I wish to spend a few moments on the wonders of beer. <laughs> if you were to chat with a brewmaster, he or she may say that beer is a complex entity. And having consumed a few myself, I might have to agree with that. But certainly beer can be broken down. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. Beer can be broken down into a number of simple components, water, hops, barley, and yeast. And curiously enough, the Germans actually regulate this. Okay? In the 16th century, they passed a law called Reinheitsgebot, which literally translated as purity law. And what it said was, if you are going to produce something called beer, it needs to have these three components, water, hops, and barley. Interestingly enough, um, the law was amended in the 20th century, 1906, because that represents uh, a better understanding of the fermentation process. In a similar manner, blood can be broken down in simple components as well. And while you could consider blood, again, uh, a complex entity, what I hope to impart to you folks tonight is the idea that actually it is a multifaceted organ. And we'll do a little discussion of all these components now. 
water. Well, yeah, it's pretty obvious. It's truly the solvent of life. You know, if there's no water, there's no life, as we humans understand it. And interestingly enough, that was one of the priorities of the Mars expedition was to search for the detection of water. Because if there's water, there may be life. Electrolytes. Yeah, the blood contains electrolytes, and the concentrations of such are regulated very tightly, uh, are tightly regulated by the kidneys. And what that does is it creates uh, an ideal environment for the blood to perform its functions. Blood contains what I like to call small molecules. And really, the, the big ones that you would think about are hormones and drugs. These compounds have a targeted organ or tissue to exert an effect. And the blood, of course, acts as a conduit to deliver those compounds to the target tissues. Blood contains proteins, a number of them. One of them is albumin. Albumin is synthesized by the liver and it has a number of different functions, but the two big ones I wish to discuss are uh, it's involved in the process of proper tissue hydration. And without getting into too many details about such things, because it would probably bore you a little bit, it's why when you look in the mirror, you don't look like a prune or a marshmallow. Albumin also has a pretty important function because it binds those small molecules that I was telling you about to transport to the target tissues. Immunoglobulin is a long, fancy term for antibodies. What's an antibody? An antibody is a protein that is designed to identify proteins as foreign on viruses, bacteria, parasites, cancer cells, and other types of uh, invasive pathogens that may cause an infection. And immunoglobulins are a, one of the arms of your immune response. Coagulation proteins are the proteins that basically allow you to clot your blood. And they represent something known as the coagulation cascade. Now, the coagulation cascade is a subject that has tormented every single medical student that's ever gone to medical school. And it's something that torments you in your first year uh, biochemistry class. Blood contains cells, yeah, we all know that. And there's a number of different cells. Uh, and all of these cells originate in your bone marrow space, which is the hollow space in your bones. You have two types of white blood cells. The first type is called leukocytes. And these are the cells that are responsible for tissue repair. Um, and that is mediated by the processes of inflammation and cellular uh, multiplication. And when I mean tissue damage, I can speak as simply as a paper cut, a broken bone, and all the way to a heart attack. It's all the same type of repair process. Lymphocytes are another type of white blood cell. And lymphocytes are responsible for your immune response. A certain type of lymphocyte produces those immunoglobulins or antibodies that I told you about just a couple slides ago. There are other types of lymphocytes that directly attack those invasive pathogens I was telling you about, you know, virus, bacteria, parasites, cancer cells. Interestingly enough, HIV or human immunodeficiency virus is a specific virus that attacks a specific lymphocyte. And, and uh, uh, excuse me, a specific lymphocyte that uh, attacks those pathogens directly. And so you can follow that if you don't have a, a relative cure for such a thing, that that would truly cripple your immune response. And that's indeed what it did and caused a, a great deal of misery. Now, gratefully, with a lot of research and clinical trials, the morbidity from HIV is 
markedly reduced to a disease now that can be survived relatively easily. Platelets um, are another type of cell that basically the way I think about it are, they're like a bomb. And it's a bomb that explodes when a platelet uh, comes into contact with damaged tissue, specifically damaged blood vessels. When you injure yourself, you injure all sorts of tissues. And one of the tissues you injure is are your blood vessel cells. And when a platelet encounters a damaged uh, blood vessel cell, it will explode, release all sorts of uh, compounds and proteins and such. And those compounds and proteins interact with those coagulation proteins that I was telling you about previously and forms that coagulation cascade that in the past tormented me, but you study enough and you get a grasp of it. Finally, we have red blood cells. In order to have a healthy uh, tissue, you need to have uh, an abundance of oxygen delivered to those tissues for your metabolism. And that is what the principal uh, function of red blood cells is, is to deliver oxygen to the tissues. The way it does it is in each red blood cell, it contains a protein called hemoglobin, which is a kind of a complex thing. I won't bore you with the structure of it, other than the fact that hemoglobin also contains four iron atoms. And each molecule, excuse me, with those four iron atoms on each molecule of hemoglobin, that allows you to bind up, up to four molecules of oxygen. So it's a very efficient system to deliver oxygen to the tissues. That iron on your red blood cells is the reason why your blood is red. <laughs> it's also the reason why your mother told you to eat leafy green vegetables with every meal, at least with dinner, because those, that food stuff contains iron that's essential for red blood cell production. Any Star Trek nerds out there besides me? All right, well, there was a, an episode you may or may not remember where uh, Spock, Mr. Spock is getting whipped and you see the striations on his back and his blood is green. Well, that's because his hemoglobin was based with copper rather than iron, so. <laughs> All right, so um, I was telling you about uh, metabolism at the tissues with um, oxygen. And of course, in healthy tissues, that's what happens. If you have a paucity of hemoglobin and red blood cells, uh, in your red blood cells, um, then you don't metabolize very well. But regardless of that, what is a product of metabolism? It's carbon dioxide. And there needs to be a way to effectively remove that carbon dioxide. And your red blood cells do that in a number of ways. One, you know, I was a chemistry major, so it's kind of a geeky thing for me, is that one way they eliminate carbon dioxide is by doing a chemical reaction in the red blood cell to convert the carbon dioxide into that bicarbonate ion I showed you before on that previous slide. And what happens then is that you convert the carbon dioxide to this bicarbonate, the blood presents it to the lung, and the lung exhales it as carbon dioxide. It's kind of nerdy, but I think it's pretty cool. So, why would we ever choose to transfuse blood or blood products? And I would imagine books have been written on it, but probably the easiest way to think about it is to correct, I'm sorry, uh, to correct an oxygen carrying capacity defect or coagulation abnormality. And what I mean by that is, um, in the circumstance, say, of a patient who has suffered severe trauma, or a patient who has undergone a long, complicated surgery that's kind of turned for the worse. In those situations, you lose a lot of blood. And when you lose a lot of blood, 
bad things happen. Two specific bad things is that you reduce oxygen carrying capacity to all your tissues. And if you've got tissues that are at risk, for instance, if you've got coronary artery disease or if you've got cerebrovascular disease where you're at risk for a stroke, if you lose this oxygen carrying capacity, you may suffer complications because of the lack of blood. Uh, furthermore, because you've lost so much blood, you've also depleted your coagulation factors as well. And in those two clinical situations, as a rule, we will administer both blood and blood products for coagulation. Now, there's also a, a large uh, segments of patients who have isolated anemia. And I don't know if any of you folks have ever had it, but you, what you immediately notice after a transfusion is that you feel much more invigorated. Why? Because you've increased your oxygen carrying capacity and you feel better. There are also disease states that um, isolate coagulation abnormalities. And, and in, in extreme situations, you may be administered coagulation, uh, or excuse me, blood products to aid to uh, solve that coagulation problem. Are there risks to getting blood products? Well, of course there are. And uh, they're known as adverse reactions. Gratefully, the most common reaction is something that occurs when you receive a properly transfused unit of blood or blood product. And what happens is, is your own immune response responds to that product because it's from a, a different human being. And the symptoms that you generally feel with something like that may be chills or fever or hives. And while those symptoms are no fun and you might feel uncomfortable, they certainly aren't a life threat. Much, much more uncommonly, gratefully, is something known as a clerical error. And what that simply means is, suppose you're type A blood. And for some horrible reason, you get transfused a unit of type B blood. Um, I won't go into all the details, but suffice it to say that that could potentially be um, certainly a morbid situation and up to possibly a lethal situation if it's not corrected, I, excuse me, identified and corrected rapidly. There's also a small risk of receiving an infection with a tainted unit of of blood or blood products. And the, the biggest ones you worry about there are hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and human immunodeficiency virus. Again, with the American blood supply is so safe because these things are tested over and over again. So it really is a rare event. And maybe it might be touched upon later in this symposium, but suffice it to say that I would rather receive a unit of blood in America than in a third world country, if you know what I mean. So, one uh, great attribute of patient blood management, which you will probably learn about later, is this. With all the risks of having to transfuse blood or blood products, we as clinicians really appreciate guidelines as to how to most prudently, rationally, and intelligently administer these products because we know the patients will need them, but we also want to be able to do it with the least risk possible. And thanks to patient blood management, we are supplied with guidelines to help us with that. So in summary, I've shown you, talked to, talk with you about how blood is essential for oxygen transport to the tissues and for vital living. I also shared with you the idea that blood is on the front line of defense when you have an infectious threat. Thirdly, blood also fixes you when you cut yourself or worse. Sounds pretty wondrous to me, don't you think? So I wanted to leave you tonight with uh, this uh, picture here. Um, it's a, a picture of a Prescott sunrise taken last December by my wife on her phone. And I figured that 
one doesn't see enough cool sunrises in their life, so I thought I would leave you with this. Thank you for your time and your attention. Giving blood is easy because it requires simply the stroke of a pen. But taking care of a patient who is anemic uh, requires much more. It requires possibly decreasing blood loss, giving different uh, medications that might spur the bone marrow to make its own blood in close observation. It's not as easy as a stroke of a pen. Nevertheless, it's much more effective. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now pleased to present to you Dr. Pierre Tibby. Thank you very much. Blood. Blood is magical. Blood can be mystical. Blood can be sacred. Blood can be evil. Blood can be life. And blood can be death. Ever since the beginning of mankind, blood has fascinated us. It's associated with just about everything that we do from birth to death. That's, oh, they changed my slide, okay. So I have 10 to 12 minutes to go through 1,500 years of the history of blood. So strap yourselves in. The first mention of blood exchange, meaning from one person to another, was mentioned by Heronius Cardanus, who was a mathematician of probability and an excellent gambler and practiced medicine without a license. This 50 years later, a man named Magnus Pigel introduced the concept of vein-to-vein -vein transfusion in theory in something that he wrote called Chirurgia Infusora. And over 50 years after that was when Richard Lauer, who was an English doctor, performed the first animal-to-animal -animal transfusion. What Dr. Lauer did, he was a, mem he was a member of the uh, Experimental Philosophy Club in Oxford with someone called, and it was, it's not 1966, it's 1666, with William Harvey, who uh, is credited as having first talked and explored circulation in man. Well, Richard Lauer took a dog, he opened the jugular vein, and he drained out several ounces or cups of blood, I'm not sure exactly, until the dog was almost lifeless was not responding to any stimuli. And then he quickly reinfused the dog's own blood back into the neck of the dog. And in his own words, after the transfusion, the dog, oblivious of its hurts, fawned upon its master. Well, back then in the mid 1600s, England and France were the major powers uh, in Europe, and they competed in everything, including medicine. Whoops, sorry. So the French had to get involved. And this is the story of a madman that was known in the streets of Paris. He basically was uh, walking around the streets, taking his clothes off, urinating, yelling things, totally a crazy person. And he was found by someone who's a friend to a doctor called Denis, Dr. Denis, who was a doctor for actually at the court of Louis XIV. And he, this man who had brought Antoine Moroy, who was the madman I'm talking about, brought him to Dr. Denis because Denis had presumed and, and thought about animal to human exchange. And back then, blood was supposed to carry the characteristics of whatever animal it is. So uh, a lion would be fierce, but a calf would be subtle, uh, 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 a calf would be gentle, 
and kind, and therefore the Antoine was taken to Dr. Denis, and what he did was infuse a couple of cups of calf's blood right into uh, the man. Well, the man had some burning in his arm. He had fevers. He didn't feel real well for a while, but after a couple of hours, he recovered. And believe it or not, he was much kinder, and he didn't yell obscenities. <laughs> Two days later, having been encouraged by this, the doctor gave him a couple of cups of calf's blood, and Antoine, unfortunately, went into shock. Uh, he uh, became unarousable. He, his blood pressure fell. His urine became black as soot. He went into renal failure. But fortunately, after a couple of days, he recovered. He went home, and actually, the, his wife said he was cured because all of a sudden, he wasn't yelling at her. He wasn't beating her. He was actually quite nice. A few weeks after that, the wife called Dr. Denis to say to come over, and she had brought a calf. She had, had set up a calf and everything that he needed and pleaded with Dr. Denis to bring the, uh, to come over and reinfuse uh, Antoine with calf's blood. Well, Dr. Denis went over there, but he absolutely refused to do this because he's almost lost the patient. Well, um, that's unfortunately what happened was that a couple of months later, Antoine died. And believe it or not, the wife sued the doctor for withholding life-saving treatment. It actually went to a French court and two things are interesting in this case. One, well, Antoine got better because he was with his transfusions because it caused a, a, a whole body fever. And Antoine was actually suffering from syphilis. And heat uh, uh, prevent, or, uh, subsides the influence of the syphilitic organism on a patient. So he actually got better because of the fever. But the second interesting thing is Mrs. Moray lost the case because it turned out that she was, in fact, poisoning him with arsenic. <laughs> True story. So in 1666, uh, to, for a couple of years, there were numerous animal-to-animal -animal and animal-to-human transfusions. Uh, they were met with... Uh, failure, and uh, in 1968, the French court banned transfusion practice, which was followed by the Italian and English courts, and we are at the first model crisis of the first era of blood transfusion. We moved to the second era of blood transfusion 150 years later, so nothing happened with transfusion or blood technology for 150 years. But in 1818, in the early 1800s, many women would die at labor because of postpartum hemorrhage. An obstetrician called James Blundell tried to, at last resort, transfuse human to human blood in patients who had postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, and for the first four out of five failed but the next four survived. Over 10 years, he had a 50% success rate, which is not a great success rate, uh, but uh, it was better than all patients dying. But this was the second model crisis. Interesting to note, uh, have you all heard of the medical journal, The Lancet? Well, for those who have, this is one of the very oldest of the medical journals. The Lancet is named The Lancet. It's like the New England Journal of Medicine Worldwide. The Lancet is named The Lancet because of acts of bloodletting and using a lancet to collect uh, blood for bloodletting. Just an interesting fact. The third era of transfusion therapy really started in the 1900s. Now, the problem is that when you transfuse human to human blood, uh, in many instances it would clot. Landsteiner, who was a, a physician, 
took uh, five of his favorite friends and had them give blood, and he mixed blood with the other five people, six people altogether. And what he realized is that a little bit more than half the blood wouldn't clot, but others, if you, uh, would mixed with other people's blood, would clot. And what he was, he was on the discovery of the four major blood groups, A, B, A, B, and O. So this was fantastic because now we knew that some donors can give blood to other donors while other donors can't, and we have a reason. But it took another 10 years for Dr. Ottenberg to publish a compatibility test where people can actually test uh, for which bloods can be transfused to which patients. But the problem was is that if you were transfusing a patient, you would have a donor, you would have to have a donor right there willing to give the blood. Because if blood uh, is allowed to sit for any period of time, three layers will, uh, will happen. You will have the packed red blood cells at the bottom, you will have a buffy coat with immunoglobulins, et cetera, and you will have a upper layer, which is a, a yellow thin serous solution called plasma. And so these, the blood would not be able to be stored, but in 1915, Lewinson uh, discovered that a small amount of sodium citrate would prevent the blood from clotting. And why was this important at this time? Because it was 1915, and we were in this first world war. And most, patient, most people in the world wars died not immediately, but from a wound and bleeding and shock. And this, to be able to preserve blood for at least a week in a bottle with sodium citrate was very important in saving wounded soldiers' lives. A blood donor base was developed and uh, more studies were done with blood preservation and the 1030 rule we'll talk about maybe later, but an important thing was fractionation and you can see that much of this was done during the Second World War. The Second World War was a time of great advances in blood transfusion therapy and actually one of the reasons that is touted as why the Allies uh, did become victorious, one of the reasons was because the Allies concentrated their efforts on preserving blood, fractionating blood, getting it to the front lines, whereas the Germans and, uh, sorry, Dr. Beck, but the Germans and the Japanese, uh, they felt that only Aryan blood should be given to a German, and therefore was, this was not important. But the interesting thing during the Second World War is we learned about fractionation because it was very cumbersome to take blood and take it to the front line, whole blood. It didn't last very long and it was very bulky and difficult to transfuse in the midst of battle. With fractionation, as I told you, we were able to separate plasma. Now plasma, as opposed to blood, can last over a year. Plasma can not only can last, but it can be fr freeze dried and then reconstituted in the field. So there was a tremendous amount of advancement during the world wars with blood therapy that saved a lot of soldiers' lives. And there were, ter there were significant national blood donation campaigns. Wherever you go, you would see to donate blood, to help the Red Cross, to save one of the soldier's life, he's got his life on the line, won't you give a unit of blood? And even Winston Churchill, the hazards of great battle lie before us. And he was able to get so many people to, that was a, I thought that was a pretty good Winston Churchill <laughs> impression, but okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there was a tremendous amount of outpouring of blood. Everybody gave it, it was their duty, and uh, we made tremendous advances in the science of blood transfusions. After the war, uh, there were two big companies, and I'm calling them companies, the Red Cross and the American Association of Blood Banks. 
and they uh, had campaigns because blood became a big, big business with big money. Uh, in fact, it's a great business because you get your raw materials for free and then you sell it. So, and, and not only was it uh, advertised throughout the United States, but in France, in China, in other parts of the Middle East, in Russia, you would get a medal, a little medal if you gave blood. But the best advertisers for blood were the Germans. And I'm not sure what one has to do with the other, but she does look a little pale, she does look a little bit weak. <laughs> now I saw that advertisement and I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, but nevertheless, blood was a huge market with, and a lot of money was made. And especially with a fractionation with hemophiliacs, uh, to be able to give them factor eight and save their lives was huge. But in the third era, as we continue in the third era of transfusion therapy, that's when we started to really hear about tainted blood. Hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis non A, non B, which was named C. And with every organism that came, there came tests to identify which units were tainted uh, and the ability to avoid the transmission of hepatitis. Unfortunately, with HIV, there, were, uh, there was less impetus for whatever reasons to not only develop these tests, to work on these patients, uh, but also with a tremendous amount of thought to the financial aspects of transfusions and transfusion therapy and not enough thought to the lives of patients because we had a tremendous amount, and this is all over the world, we had a tremendous amount of factors to treat hemophiliacs, but we started to realize that many of these factors were contaminated with HIV because it takes you can give one unit of whole blood and that's from one person to another, but to make factor you have to pool hundreds of patients. So if any of those patients are infected, and oftentimes they would take uh, blood from uh, skid row patients, from prison, etc. If any of those people were tainted, one of those hundreds of people, then that factor would be contaminated. And it was not only a business, but it was an expensive business. And uh, there was a shift in the paradigm of transfusion when HIV reared its ugly head. In fact, criminal convictions ensued. Here you will see a man named Goretta, who uh, was a Frenchman and he was head of the French transfusion services. And I can tell you the French, you know the French, they're proud about everything. And they were proud because all their blood was absolutely pure because it was pure French blood. Well, that's not the case. <laughs> and this man actually was convicted. Numerous other people, uh, government officials and industry leaders were accused of delaying implementation of potential blood safety measures. I would encourage you to read a book called Aptly Blood uh, by a man named Douglas Starr. It's a fascinating lay read and it goes through all this and uh, it, it's absolutely fascinating to see all the wonderful things that were done with blood but all the terrible things too that blood has done and people have done with blood. This is a list of people in France in Germany, in Switzerland, in Japan, uh, who were tried and many of them convicted for withholding treatment when, uh, for giving the wrong treatment when a better uh, treatment was withheld simply for financial and some political reasons. So blood, as you know, can save lives, but blood can destroy lives. And our job as physicians and the reason that we're here today 
is to talk about ways that we can avoid the unnecessary risks of blood. So I think I went over a little bit, and I apologize, but that was 1,500 years worth. Um, so thank you very much. We'll talk to you later. So often in life, we're not really interested in things until we need to be. But YRMC is very proactive in going out to the community. We go to um, the educational facilities, such as Yavapai College. We go to assisted living uh, facilities, rehabilitation facilities, to really reach out to the community and provide opportunities for them to come and hear doctors speak about patient blood management and to understand what they can do proactively to take good care of their health and particularly their blood health. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Black. After Dr. Tibby's presentation, how many of us feel like we really have a better understanding of why we use that phrase, practicing medicine? Because that's what I got, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Uh, in 2016, the Seattle Times reported that juvenile salmon in the Puget Sound swimming in uh, water that was discharged from the wastewater treatment plants were full of drugs. For example, they found Prozac, Advil, Benadryl, Lipitor, even cocaine. They found Flonase, Paxil, Valium, Oxycontin, and others. So consult your doctor to see if salmon is right for you. <laughs> I share this because to me, it illustrates what's been called the law of unintended consequences. We just can't possibly know the future impact of the things that we're doing today. And we've certainly seen this was true in transfusion medicine. For example, one of the things that at least in part came out of the HIV crisis of the 80s was the idea of pre-donation and storage of a patient's own blood prior to elective surgeries. And then if necessary, giving it back to the patient during or after surgery. But in subsequent years, it's understood that this actually can create anemia in the patient prior to surgery, since it takes four to six weeks for those red blood cells that were taken to be replenished in the body. Besides, even your own blood it's still stored blood, which is not the same as fresh blood moving through our bodies or the blood that's taken just immediately before surgery and then infused after, immediately after surgery. In fact, in 2015, an important discovery was made regarding the crucial role of nitric oxide in our blood. This element must accompany hemoglobin to enable those blood vessels to open up to be able to receive the oxygen to the tissues. It's the gatekeeper, if you will. However, as researchers pointed out, blood in a blood bank, stored blood, be it yours or that of another person, is missing this important blood gas. And that, quote, infusing stored blood may actually cause plugging of blood vessels in tissues, making things worse, end quote. Now, in the early 90s, following the recognition of the risks of HIV and viral hepatitis, effective testing for these viruses accelerated, and the probability of transmission has been drastically reduced today in the US. Furthermore, in 1993, the Red Cross, who currently supplies between 40 to 50% of the blood supply in the US, they were following a lawsuit by the US government. They were put under a federal injunction to take the necessary steps to, quote, provide the safest possible blood services, end quote. Now, while the Red Cross injunction was lifted in 2015, uh, most in the industry do believe that the blood supply in the US today is as safe as it's ever been when it comes to disease transmission. The question always is, though, what is the unknown infectious disease that's out there? Current blood safety measures are only going to test for known viruses. You can't test for something that you don't know about. 
And it's been noted that in the world today, an infectious disease in one country is a threat to all. In 2002, West Nile virus was identified as a transfusion transmissible disease. Now, more recently, we think of the Zika virus. Um, though it was discovered and first isolated from a rhesus monkey in the Zika forest of Uganda in 1947, and then it likely circulated in humans from 1951 to 1981, mostly in Asian and African countries, the potential for Zika virus transmission through blood transfusion wasn't really understood until an outbreak in French Polynesia in 2013. Um, the first confirmed transfusion transmitted case was March of 2015 in Brazil. And this was when a patient received blood from a donor who only showed symptoms of infection three days after he donated. And then 11 months later, the FDA provided recommendations for donor screening and then product management to reduce the risk of transmission through transfusions. And they continued to provide updated guidelines. So while we realize that the possibility of disease transmission through transfusion has been greatly reduced, we must understand two additional risks of tr transfusion that began to be recognized by the late 80s and the early 90s. Namely, increased likelihood of cancer recurrence after cancer surgery in patients with a history of transfusion. And also the association between transfusion and increased incidence of infections in patients that were undergoing um, spinal, other orthopedic, or coronary artery surgery. And we now understand more fully the immunosuppressive effects of donor blood transfusion. So clearly, ongoing medical research continues to impact clinical practice. And yet, we've also seen that transfusion medicine has very often been driven by institutional culture and physician behavior. Consider the interesting development that came out of the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. So in 1988, the National Institutes of Health held a consensus conference where it was suggested that there was no evidence to support the widespread practice of using a hemoglobin concentration of 10 grams per deciliter as a transfusion indicator. Instead, seven grams per deciliter was suggested as a more reasonable possible indicator for transfusion if the patient was symptomatic. And yet, that was 1988, and yet the percentage of all inpatient stays with a red blood cell transfusion nearly doubled from 2000 to 2013. And in 2010, blood transfusion was the most common procedure performed during hospitalizations in the US, with one in 10 patients undergoing an invasive procedure receiving a transfusion. According to the American Red Cross, per capita, transfusions in the US are higher than in other Western countries. And it was noted that there's a great variation in practice. In other words, why does one doctor give blood when another doctor would not do that in the same case? So by the late 90s, for reasons that are now quite obvious, and to better answer the needs for patients for whom blood transfusion is not an option, organizations began to develop patient blood management concepts. They've advanced to include pharmacologic therapies, um, optimization of pre-surgical hemoglobin, meticulous surgical and blood salvage techniques during procedures, along with many other modalities. Well, what about here in Prescott, Arizona? When Dr. Tibby arrived in 2007 to move forward the heart program at YRMC, he had been a cardiothoracic surgeon for 17 years, and he brought with him the patient blood management principles that he'd already been successfully employing in his practice. And he really wanted all YRMC patients to benefit from blood management. Well, the forward-thinking leadership at YRMC was 100% behind the development of a patient blood management program. And in 2012, Dale Black, as program coordinator, uh, began working along with Dr. Tibby to develop a leadership team made up of various departments and specialties. And they welcomed education on applying PBM principles in their various fields. Um, that really started this ongoing process of both clinicians and members of the community 
to understand the safe and effective alternatives to blood transfusion, to really promote the understanding that patients benefit when they're not unnecessarily exposed to the risks associated with this liquid transplant. So PBM is patient-focused. It's not product-focused. However, we do look at the reduction of blood use in the course of a patient's care as a measure of success because these patients then have had that much less exposure to risk. So as we review the published studies showing improved outcomes for patients when transfusions are avoided, we can see the basis for viewing this data as very positive. And as this graph demonstrates, by um, 2016, we'd seen decreases in the transfusion of red blood cells and fresh frozen plasma by 28% compared to those four-year averages before the program ever started. And with the further reductions that we've seen this year, we'll have achieved a 32% decrease in red blood cells and 62% decrease in fresh frozen plasma compared to before the program. You know, many physicians have noted that probably it's safe to say that no patient really wants a transfusion, but all surely do want good, sound, evidence-based care. You see, in addition to that passive principle that you've heard first, that is above all else, do no harm, there's another principle of medical ethics that's called beneficence, that is doing good. So what are just a few key areas where patient blood management has enabled YRMC physicians to do even more good? Well, first, as doctors um, treat a sick patient, they start with diagnosing disease, not just throwing therapies. For example, if you were diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia, some physicians would view red blood cell transfusion as a possible treatment, but wouldn't you rather have it cured? So we're focusing more on diagnosing the cause of anemia and then the appropriate treatment to take care of it, because that's an area of great need uh, in our community and many others. Certainly another principle that surgeons embrace is that they don't view bleeding and surgery as uh, business as usual. Uh, many measures are taken to reduce and manage blood loss. In fact, although a recent uh, AABB report indicates that 21% of red blood cell uh, units are transfused in the surgical setting, at YRMC in the last 18-month period, only about 7% of RBCs, or red blood cells, were transfused in that setting. So we're seeing excellent results from applying PBM strategies in our surgical departments. And a third area I'll mention is that steps are being taken to avoid unnecessary laboratory draws for hospitalized patients. If you've been hospitalized, you know that's when the nurse or the phlebotomist, they come in every morning to draw blood from you. Um, one renowned PBM physician observed that the number one reason for phlebotomy must be sunrise itself, because <laughs> they come. So since this has been proven to actually create or contribute to anemia, efforts are being made to be much more judicious in ordering lab draws. So I think the simple message of PBM is let's keep your blood in you to the extent possible and keep it working properly. Now, as we now listen to the third part of our symposium, Transfusion Medicine, What the Future Holds, I thought it was fitting to close on this uh, message from the Red Cross website, the American Red Cross. And remember, they supply about 40 to 50% of the nation's blood supply. But regarding patient blood management, they said it is now the standard of practice and care. Thank you. Kind of makes sense. If you lose blood, give blood to put it back. That worked in, in combat medicine. We've blindly translated that over to civilian medicine where that's just not the case. We didn't have the scrutiny of medical trials on, on the safety of blood transfusion when it was first implemented. Now that we've been able to look at, at what happens when you receive a, a blood transfusion, we've really started to identify some of the adverse effects that come about with the red blood cell transfusion. And I don't think those effects are something that we can ignore any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jared Head. Hey guys, 
Um, thanks for joining us tonight. And you know, before we get started, I really want to uh, send a special thanks out to Dale and Beth and the PBM team at Yavapai Regional Medical Center. They do a heck of a job, and without this, without them, we're not here. So let's let's give it again. All right, just a little about me, and, and we're going to go pretty quick with a little about me because there's really not too much there. Um, my, uh, my background, I started as an open heart nurse in the CVICU. Where our open heart patients, they, they didn't get blood. We had a restrictive transfusion policy there. And so I was exposed to that. And these guys, they did better or just as well as the ones who did. Um, so maybe there's something to this. I kept on going with my education. Uh, currently, uh, I'm an acute care nurse practitioner for the hospitalist group at Yavapai Regional. Um, some of you guys might know one of my partners. Can I get a can I get a you know a clap or something? Does anyone know Alex Chapa, Dr. Chapa? Well, Dr. Chapa couldn't be here tonight with us, but. Last thing Dr. Chapa told me was he wanted a selfie with me and the crowd. So everyone, you know, give a good wave. All right, we'll get this over to Dr. Chapa. So I've been able to advance from registered nurse to nurse practitioner and apply to some of these principles to my everyday practice. Um, but the one thing I don't have is a crystal ball, okay? Uh, funny enough, in 2008, the American Society of Hematology, did I tell you I'm talking about the future of transfusion medicine? Did I leave that part out? I apologize. We're going to go to the future for a minute. 2008, the American Society of Hematology celebrated their 50-year anniversary. Now, there, around that time, there were editorials written in transfusion journals about what transfusion medicine would look like in 2025. All right, still, still seven years away, right? Seven? Okay, I'm from Mississippi, you have to excuse me. <laughs> um, and, and some of the, yeah, there we go, some of the questions that they asked in 2008 would we still be talking about transfusion medicine in 2025? Can we make transfusion safer? Will blood substitutes finally emerge on the market after several failures? Can we grow blood? You know, can we put a little culture medium and sprinkle some sterile water on there and see what happens? And, and what about blood banks? Are they, are they going to be around in 2025? So those were some of the questions that were asked then. So we kind of have a de facto crystal ball at the halfway point. We can look and see where they're right. Transfusion medicine, yes, it's still here. You get a textbook for it, it's probably still here. Um, and there's all sorts of little niches and transfusion medicine. So as a medical subspecialty, it's live and well. Can we make transfusion safer? Yeah, yeah, and I think we've done a heck of a job. Like uh, Beth was talking about, we can, we can identify these pathogens quicker, more effectively, and we can do things like put them under UV light, to rip everything out of there, and the only thing you're getting are the packed red cells. Um, a big, big question was blood substitutes. Still not there yet. We are there with sweeteners and substitutes for Gouda, but not artificial hemoglobin carriers. The, the one interesting thing to me was the blood bank question. When I, when I first read that, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, blood banks are going to be around. we, we got to have blood banks around. Um, but maybe. In 2025, will we still be storing blood in blood banks? Or 
Are we going to store other things? Are they going to look for a new, you know, are they going to start storing stem cells to help develop a unit of blood rather than someone else's blood? Who knows? That's still a uh, topic for discussion. All right, now on to the future. Anybody like Doctor Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jody Whitaker? No, okay, all right. All right, so what's next? Blood substitutes. We're looking for an artificial hemoglobin carrier. We've been looking for about 70 years, to be fair. Um, can we do something with the genetic profile of these cells? Maybe alter them a little? Um, what about those stem cells? I think we can use those for developing a safer blood transfusion, but we're still looking for the holy grail. Uh, 70 years on, we're still looking for that optimal artificial hemoglobin carrier and get oxygen to those tissues without having any of the biological baggage that a unit of red blood cells has. Um, that was for all you Monty Python fans out there. All right, so artificial hemoglobin carriers, okay. Resources have just been dumped into this. Primarily, a lot of them have been, a lot of the focus of the research has been stopper, uh, excuse me, supported and funded by the U.S. military. Makes sense, right? These guys are going into combat, you know, instead of doing blood. If we can give them something a little, that's artificial, and still deliver the oxygen, that would be amazing. So the first generations, well, they didn't work out so well. They, they compared the mortality of people who got blood transfusions versus the artificial hemoglobin carriers. They didn't work out well. They tried again with the second generation, and the same still. Now, the later generations, the ones that are derived from that they're trying to attach the hemoglobin molecule to polyethylene glycol and silica, we have seen dramatic improvement. Uh, they're still in FDA testing. And some of the first and second generation artificial hemoglobin carriers you can find. You gotta go to places like Kazakhstan, um, you know, Southeast Asia, but, um, our FDA, our government, has never given them the green light, and they've actually halted many of the studies. So where's, where's the research going? What's next? You know, if we can't fine-tune this, is there, another, is there another avenue that we could take? Who's heard of CRISPR? Yo, yo, CRISPR folks? All right. CRISPR has made it so easy for us to muck around with the DNA. And if we can muck around with the DNA enough, we can create blood. Um, not only can we create blood, we can create universal donor types. So it's safe for you, safe for you, no matter if you're A, no matter if you're B, no matter if you're AB, doesn't matter. However, it's really expensive. The technology hasn't been hasn't advanced to the point where it's feasible in everyday practice. Unfortunately, uh, we're still a little while away. But I think, I think it's coming. And it might be here quicker than we, than we realize. Stem cells. Um, they've tried them, and they use them in Germany. They're very time consuming to make. It takes about a couple of weeks to take human stem cells and to transfer it to a unit of red blood cells. There's no long-term data on it, so we really don't know what the long-term implications are. Um, and one thing that uh, many um, agencies, insurers look at, it's very expensive to develop one unit of stem cell based um, blood costs 
well, in Germany, thousands of euros. So we're not quite there yet. And um, we've only seen it in limited use populations there. So maybe as the technology develops, this, this might be an avenue that we can take. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, so what about the future? I mean, I, 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 I'm going to point right here. You know, transfusion medicine has come a long way. We're still growing, we're still learning, we're still developing. Safety is still our top priority. But maybe what we're doing now, keeping blood inside the body, minimizing blood draws, uh, harnessing anemia. Uh, maybe the future of transfusion medicine is patient blood management. Um, thank you guys, <laughs> and you all have a good night. My hopes and expectations for the symposium this evening is to be able to bring forward from multiple disciplines education for patients as well as providers and offer alternative options such as in my discipline of structural interventional cardiology using minimally invasive procedures that will reduce the risk of bleeding and the requirement for complex blood management that might require transfusion. So I hope we all can learn and understand what our options are. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Sandos Mawalla. Good evening, everybody. I don't think I need a microphone. My voice is really loud by nature. So um, I'm honored for this opportunity. Thank you very much to Mr. Black and Dr. TV and Mrs. Black as well uh, for this opportunity to be able to uh, uh, just share a, uh, a little minute aspect of what we do in the big scheme of um, blood management. So I'm an interventional cardiologist and um, uh, uh, basically, in simple English, I'm a plumber. So uh, that's what we, you know, we get called and labeled. I was given uh, the task of uh, uh, presenting heart surgery without surgery. Uh, the fancy word for it is minimally invasive, but the goal to it is to minimize cutting the skin. So um, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible uh, and more applicable as possible. Uh, and I, I thought, like, how am I going to do this with Dr. Tibby being here after 30 years of, um, a, you know, open heart surgery? I'm, I'm humbled uh, uh, just to be able to, um, I, I don't know how you can compete with that. Uh, and <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I had looked at one of the slides that have been presented prior, and um, uh, what I enjoyed a lot about this slide is the fact that how all the circles uh, intersect. Um, so for me, blood management, my role is to minimize it. Um, uh, I know Jared was talking about looking for the holy grail. My holy grail is minimize it. And as a result, then you don't have to worry about having to, to deal with the complication of losing it. However, it's um, truly a multidisciplinary approach. And um, I'm lucky I've been um, out of training for about 11 years. And I'm lucky to be part of the development in medical history where we are finally part of a team. Um, it's not one person decision, one specialty decision, but truly a multidisciplinary decision to try to find the best option for the patient um, and be a, a patient-centered uh, decision. Uh, because in my opinion, when it's a cumulative decision, you do have a better outcome. Um, so from a uh, minimally invasive, I just thought I'll, I'll just... Um, uh, go through a quick summary of some of the procedures that we are doing that are considered in the um, arena of minimally invasive um, and uh, that would uh, basically avoid uh, the patient undergoing 
uh, open heart surgeries um, and higher risk of blood loss. Um, uh, I'm sure the majority of you are familiar with coronary stenting, um, and uh, that basically became the advent starting in the late 70s using balloons, onwards to the 70s with 80s primitive um, stenting, and then subsequently improving the qualities of stenting. But that was the um, uh, 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 basically the answer to open heart surgery for coronary artery bypass graft as cabbage. Um, the more development over the last 10 years probably spanned the other arenas uh, where it's TAVR or TAVI as a uh, parallel option for patients um, instead of open heart surgery for aortic valve replacement. Uh, mitral clip is uh, just the tip of the iceberg of the array of uh, devices that are gonna come on the market over the next 10 years and 15 years to address uh, patients who have pathologies in the mitral valve and that's a substitute for mitral valve replacement. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, then there are other um, uh, sort of unique procedures. Uh, the One of the quite important procedure I believe that came um, uh, over the last 10 years is what we call the Watchman procedure or left atrial appendage occlusion. Um, and this is relevant for a lot of patients who unfortunately are on blood thinners for treatment of atrial fibrillation and they sustain complications from the anticoagulation and they bleed heavily and um, historically we had no other options for them other than take them off the medication that puts them at a high risk of stroke. So certainly I feel this is a huge advent um, uh, that had come over the last 10 years. Um, uh, today we were uh, lucky that these are actually our procedures today um, at YRMC. Uh, there are patients who are born with defects um, and um, uh, historically as well, uh, repairing these defects has been surgical and over the last 10, 15 years, uh, there has been a lot of development into being able to uh, uh, treat them without having to cut the chest open. Uh, paravalvular leak, I'll share with you at the end. Uh, actually, today was the first case at YRMC that we did uh, with the assistance of uh, Dr. Gellert, our world-renowned cardiac imager, um, who we're honored to have. Um, uh, so I'm just gonna uh, go back and show you some slide about uh, some of these um, different procedures we spoke about. Uh, there are patients, uh, such as this patient, uh, who have what we call chronic total occlusion in their arteries, meaning their arteries have completely closed, the body's made bypasses to it, um, and uh, this is the number one reason, in addition to multivessel disease, that patient gets sent to open heart surgery for bypass. However, a lot of these patients have weak heart, unable to sustain open heart surgery being on a heart pump machine. As a result, over the last, I would say, eight years, a newer discipline of what we call chronic total occlusion or CTO have evolved with a lot of technology, a lot of newer equipment to allow us to open these arteries that have been closed and sometimes for years to be able to provide blood supply without having to do open heart surgery. This is what the artery looked after it's been fixed with stents, as opposed to the lack of blood that's covering in this area, um, th there was no flow into um, that vessel. Um, and uh, I believe that technology is only gonna get better, and there are now newer therapeutic options to try to see can we open these arteries that have been closed for so long using certain uh, medication or chemicals, but the technology is here, and um, uh, and I have to apologize to Dr. TB because that's practically stealing their business. But anyway, um, uh, uh, so these are some of the equipment that we use. Uh, there are stingray balloons. They all have sexy names. I don't know where they come up with these names. At the end of the day, they are basically a plumbing business. You have a blockage, you are bypassing the blockage, able to find equipment to cross it, balloon, and then ultimately restore um, uh, the blood flow in this, um, in this artery. So um, I'm gonna go on to the valve arena. 
um, and you're going to see amazing pictures. Uh, they are courtesy of Dr. George Gellert as well. Um, he's a world-renowned cardiac anesthesiologist and cardiac imager. We are lucky now to be able to capture a few days in the month to be able to have him here with us to help us build our valve program and structural program, uh, which is really building um, uh, on the great foundation that Dr. Tibby has done really over the last 10 years and tried to bring a lot of the newer technology uh, to this community. So this is a what we call a, a 3D echo, active echo, um, where you are able to look at the three major valves in the heart, the aortic valve, the mitral, and then the tricuspid. And, um, and this is actually a bit of cheating. These images you will never get to see as beautiful in, in many, many, many experienced cardiologists and imager. Um, so let's start with the aortic valve. Um, up till about 10 years ago, the only option for treating patients whose aortic valve narrowed with calcium and built up of plaque is aortic valve replacement that require cutting the chest, putting them on a hard pump machine, and replacing it with a new valve. Um, and uh, uh, Sometimes there are other pathologies, not to labor on that point. Uh, the development came actually from this gentleman. His name is uh, Dr. Anderson, who is um, a Danish cardiologist who was doing fellowship at the Phoenix Heart Institute, at the uh, Arizona Heart Institute, when the idea came to him from the stents that we talked about, if we are able to put a stent and open the artery, why can't we create a valve on a stent platform? And that came in the 80s, just so that the idea came to him in the late 80s. Um, and, um, and now that led to the development of this valve, and he was fortunate to be able to do that for his dad. This is his dad who received the valve. So there is a bit of Arizona history um, in this story. Um, this physician, his name is Alain Gribier, is a, um, a heart surgeon in France who did the first placement of this uh, valve without having to cut the chest open um, on this patient. This was done in 2002. In the United States, we are lacking behind Europe by about 10 years of staging, partly because of the regulatory nature in the FDA versus uh, the European regulatory body, um, and that has delayed the development or the application of these equipments in the United States. However, we have that available here. Um, and just you can imagine from 2002 when that was done, in the United States, this is when the trial started, so just imagine it's eight years after Europe, and now um, in 2018, we are on our third generation of the valve with very, very good outcomes. So it's a rapid progression uh, of this technology. The principle of it, um, is to place the valve in the older valve, which crushes the older valve to the side, and then you have a new functioning valve. Currently in the United States, there are two types of valve available. Edwards was probably accounts maybe for about 80% of the market. It's a very robust valve, excellent function. And then the other one is the Medtronic valve. Uh, they are different in design, different in mechanism, different in how you get placed. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, it does the same job. Um, and all of that, um, in 90% of the patient, this is delivered via their femoral artery. And in some other patients whose arteries are not allowed the size of this equipment to pass, we can go through the subclavian, sometimes through a little incision in the chest that is no more than a centimeter of an incision to two centimeters of an incision. So very minimally invasive. Um, I am sorry that this came up really dark, just uh, I think just as it transferred the video, but I'm showing you a video as to when we are deploying this valve. And as you can see, um, uh, this patient actually has a, a very, very uh, tortuous foundy aorta. Um, uh, so we are able to deal with a lot of complicated uh, medical processes to deliver this. Um, that's another one for the valve. That's the second type of the valve. I wouldn't bore you with that. So moving on to the mitral. 
The second valve that we're talking about, the mitral valve, which is um, uh, draws the name from uh, the Catholic Bishop Maitre, uh, where it's the two leaflet that closes um, to prevent the, the blood from leaking backwards in the left side of the heart. Um, the mitral clip is a device that we also do through the vein, um, and it is um, a, uh, a, a very interesting uh, concept that was stolen from the surgeons. Uh, there is a, a surgeon called Alfieri who came up with the idea that maybe if we put a stitch across the valve, um, we will cut back on the leakage of the valve, um, and that led to a technology over about 20 years it took to get to this current technology. Um, and we are uh, proud to actually declare that we will be starting this in Prescott on uh, November 8th. Um, and um, uh, to be able to do these kind of procedures, it truly is a multidisciplinary approach that involves the surgeons, uh, interventional cardiologists, the imager, anesthesia, to be able to do these cases as safely um, uh, and as accurately as possible. Um, this is the, just some videos of um, where the clip, as I was showing in the illustration, uh, basically able to bring the leaflets together, uh, which will uh, reduce the leakage uh, of the valve. Now, the other uh, procedure we talked about a little earlier is the uh, Watchman procedure. There are a lot of patients who are afflicted with uh, atrial fibrillation and irregular rhythm that makes them prone to having strokes uh, because the heart doesn't beat in an organized fashion. It's sort of a quiver. And uh, this chamber in the left side of the heart acts as a lagoon. And ultimately, when the blood is not beating, it clots. So you end up forming clots here that travels to the brain and cause strokes. And um, the main therapy that has been for many, many years is warfarin, as a lot of people have heard. And over the last 10 years, we have newer medications um, to try uh, to prevent these blood clots from forming. However, as we know, the thinner the blood, the more likely the risk of bleeding, whether falling and breaking bone or cracking the head or bleeding from an ulcer uh, or even nicking yourself or a work-related injury. Um, and as a result, 25% of patients who have this disease currently are unable to take blood thinners because of prior complications from the bleeding. So they are left with no other option to prevent their strokes until this technology came. And what's currently available in the United States by the FDA is a device called the Watchman device. It's practically like a mushroom-like button that has a mesh on it. And um, it gets deployed um, also through a little um, needle incision and a sheath in the groin to plug this hole. And within about four to six weeks, the body makes a layer, seals it. During those six weeks, the patient would have to be on blood thinner and subsequently they get taken off safely. And uh, the trials showing equivalent stroke protection as with medication. So I actually feel this is a very, very important development um, in the last uh, 15 years. This is an example of some of the imaging where um, we deploy these procedures. And the appendage looks like they all have names. Whoever named them must have been really hungry, like chicken wing and broccoli. and. And I don't know where they come up. I'm telling you these names. And uh, so this looks like a cactus, apparently. Um, that's the name that we used. And uh, we end up placing um, uh, the device that looks like a little strawberry or a mushroom into this chamber uh, to plug that. Um, and uh, the, uh, la one of the last two things I'll talk about are these congenital defects. Many of us are born with uh, holes in our heart, either because um, uh, we did not complete the cardiac development while in, in utero, um, and uh, these holes in the heart leads to a lot of complications down the line, either strokes or um, actually pressure changes where the people lose their oxygenation and they go into congestive heart failure, um, and uh, up till about, um, I would say, 20 years uh, ago, the only therapy available for these patients 
um, is open heart surgery to close and put a patch on these holes. And um, subsequently, there was an array of devices that came on, and currently we, did, we plug them with uh, devices called the Amplax occluders. They are practically meshes uh, that come on a metal, and we end up placing um, one side on the left side, one side on the right side, um, and close the hole. The patient has to be on blood thinner for six to eight weeks, and the body just basically covers it and becomes part of there and closes the hole. Um, uh, uh, I think this is a very, very important uh, uh, technology because today we did a similar procedure. This is a video that shows this is what this kind of mesh would look like, uh, comes in. It takes about 15 minutes to do the actual procedure. Uh, the imaging and the anesthesia will take longer, but the actual procedure itself, as opposed to having to put somebody um, on a heart machine to be able to close that. And uh, last week we did a case on a young lady. She said I'm uh, okay to discuss her case here. Um, interestingly, 25 years ago, her mother had exactly the same situation. Her mother stroked exactly at the same age. This patient is 37 years of age. And you know, 30 years ago, her mom had to have open heart surgery to close the, the, the hole. Uh, this patient came in one day, had it. She left the next morning and she's doing very well. Um, and uh, these are um, uh, some of the pictures to show the illustration as to how this device uh, straddles these uh, uh, chambers in the heart, uh, unplug the hole. This amazing image here from Dr. Gellert, it's uh, practically like you're looking with a camera inside the heart. And you can tell how um, we are safe to make sure that the device is stable and it's not going to embolize uh, across. Um, and um, so the last one uh, that I will share with you is a, called the paravalvular leak, uh, which is uh, a, a really uh, very, very important development too. Um, there are patients who had a lot of valves uh, surgeries done uh, for different reasons, like we said earlier, um, uh, for a variety of reasons, either the valve dehiscence or they get an infection or they have certain calcium around that makes it difficult and the valve will tear uh, from the suturing where it was anchored to. And uh, some of these patients have, have weaker heart, congestive heart failure. We are um, unable to put them back in again to do another procedure uh, and so forth. And we plug them with these um, uh, tiny plugs that looks like a little button that they also straddle both sides. So one part of the plug sits on top and on the bottom and it plugs the hole. And uh, today actually was the first case we did in uh, YRMC in Prescott. So I hope um, I have uh, uh, no more slides. They are definitely not as exciting, but I hope I just shared with you just some of the technologies that are currently available um, to patients so that we can do these minimally invasive procedures safely, um, avoiding um, uh, doing open heart procedure, consequently avoiding blood loss. Um, I don't want to... Uh, anybody to go with this um, uh, um, unrealistic concept that uh, complications don't happen. Uh, you know, none of none of what we do is a panacea to answer to to, to everything, because patients bleed. They you are cannulating their arteries. They bleed. Uh, this equipment is sitting in their heart. They can have risk of complication. But uh, uh, as we are getting better at doing these procedures in a very very safe manner. I hope that we can reduce um, uh, the risk of bleeding and consequently contribute to this uh, part of the blood management heart team. Thank you for your attention. We can inform new and even seasoned healthcare practitioners about patient blood management through the most recent research. Face it, when a student's sitting in a classroom, the textbook's five, sometimes 10 years outdated behind what's actually happening in the evidence. So if we provide timely updated research, we can update those already in the field. My hopes and expectations from this symposium this evening is that we all walk away tonight realizing we have options. Be it a healthcare provider, and I'm including the physician, the nurse, the pharmacist, there's a team. Be it the patient, the patient's support system, Let's realize we have options and choices, and let's all go home tonight empowered. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now pleased to welcome Dr. Selena Bliss.
would you feel if something you've been doing all along was suddenly found to be ineffective and possibly dangerous? For example, working with a patient who's slightly anemic but non-symptomatic, and you give them a unit of blood, and they progress into fluid volume overload, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema. You would stop, right? Or would you modify your approach, perhaps avoiding blood loss, perhaps giving one unit of blood instead of two at a time? Perhaps looking at alternatives to blood transfusions altogether. After all, isn't the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? Even the Institute of Medicine realized something's got to change as this group's been publishing ongoing studies on safety in the healthcare system since 1999. I say stop the madness and reduce the risks for the patients we serve. We know it's not easy being a patient in the healthcare system, and in fact, there's books out there on the subject. These are just two of them. Not that anyone particularly plans their hospitalization, although some that have elective surgeries can do so. An example of a book on the subject of being a patient includes the one on the left that's called An Insider's Guide that speaks to the culture of a hospital, how it functions, and what are some of the expectations from the healthcare providers. The other book on the right speaks to mitigating the risks associated with missed nursing care, that is nursing care left undone. This one was actually written by a nurse who was hospitalized with a life-threatening condition when she learned the importance of the role of the nurse on her path to recovery. Her book helps us to understand the science and value of nursing care and the risks associated with not providing it. I want to thank the Patient Blood Management Program for this opportunity to share the nurse's role in patient blood management and to introduce myself. I'm Selena Bliss, and I have the blessed position to work not only as a nurse at the hospital, but to teach here at Yavapai College in the nursing program. And I was first exposed to patient blood management back in the 1990s. Now, this was before it had a name. Back then, we called it bloodless medicine, and it referred to a group of practices that promoted the use of blood conservation techniques. The motivation at the time, well, for some it was religious, and for others it was a concern about the risks of receiving blood products. The content wasn't in the textbooks at the time, so we would bring guest speakers to our nursing classes. Well, fast forward, here we are today. We have the PBM, Patient Blood Management Program, and we also have the International Society for Advancement of Blood Management, SABM which now gives us the authenticity and the merit to those sound principles we had back in the 90s. Now, to award continuing nursing education units for our nurses in the audience, this is the first year for that, we need to meet some objectives. Mine focus on the role of the nurse, empowerment of the patient and the family through education, and advocacy through collaboration with patients and their families. Now, these objectives bring me to this diagram on the slide, and it's also in one of your brochures. With patient blood management, as you can see in the center of this diagram, it's all about improved patient outcomes. That is, patient-centered care. And as you can see from the diagram, this requires a four-pronged approach. For patient-centered decision-making, knowledge and understanding of treatment options is critical. For interdisciplinary blood conservation modalities, you're gonna see a team approach is important. For optimizing coagulation and managing anemia, I will share with you how the nurse can be your advocate as you face the migrant of choices in healthcare. So using this four-pronged approach, let's start with patient-centered decision-making, in which we know knowledge and understanding in, of your treatment options is critical. But it's tough making life and death decisions in emergency situations, whether it's for yourself or a loved one. As you can see from this word cloud on the topic of the patient perception experience, there's a lot thrown at you when you become a patient. However, to make sound decisions, let's start with an assessment of the situation. When assessing the patient, the nurse monitors for signs and symptoms of anemia. We look for sources of blood loss, such as in the stools, surgery, or trauma. We consider your past medical history, such as renal failure, where the kidneys don't make erythropoietin, to stimulate the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. We consider your diet, especially vegan, or absorption problems that can cause iron deficiency anemia. We also go over your medication list when you are admitted to the hospital. It's important for the healthcare team to know if you are using over-the-counter medications, such as aspirin or ibuprofen, which could cause bleeding. 
We will also look at your prescription medications, such as anticoagulants, such as Coumadin. And we also take in consideration herbals, such as ginkgo biloba, ginseng, and garlic, to name a few. Then to clearly communicate to the rest of the team, we document by flagging charts for those patients who are not to receive blood. And we use these no blood wristbands, such as the one I'm wearing here, to literally have our patients wear these in the facility. For the second prong of the patient blood management, that of interdisciplinary conservation modalities, here's where the team approach is important. Let's face it, hospitals are fast-paced, risky, and complex environments, and strong teams are essential to avoid errors. Our team of interdisciplinary providers include our nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians, pharmacists, dietitians, physical therapists, medical lab professionals, and more. When acknowledging team member contributions at Yavapai Regional Medical Center, we sponsor what's called Lunch and Learns. We use the tagline, because we sh care, let's share. And we get together from the different units in the hospital, and we share our best practices. For example, recently, the emergency department with the early use of tranexamic acid in the treatment of traumatic bleeding. In the OB unit, the use of prenatal iron and the delay of cord clamping upon delivery. In the intensive care unit, consideration of continuous hemoglobin monitoring in lieu of those frequent blood draws. Also, the use of smaller tubes for lab draws, reducing the amount of waste we, when we clear the lines, and reducing the number of times, as you heard mentioned earlier. That's what's called iatrogenic anemia, when we cause your anemia from too many blood draws. In the OR, we're using interoperative blood salvage techniques and cell-saving techniques. We have mini circuits we can use to reduce blood loss and the perioperative use of normal volemic hemodilution. Those are two big words, but what it means is during surgery, the blood is removed, hemodiluted, brought back into the patient at the close of the surgery, thereby saving those precious red blood cells. On the med surge unit where I work, we try to stop the bleed. We act quickly to identify and stop sources of blood loss. And to build up red blood cells in the body, we give intravenous iron and erythropoietin to some of our pre-op patients. We round with our physicians as well as nurse to nurse at change of shift. We'll literally have report at your bedside to involve you and your family to help provide clear communication and a plan to care for your anemia. Here's where we'll also provide counseling and education. Clear communication with the healthcare team is essential. Most professions have their own unique language and nurses are no different. We use what's called a structured approach called SBAR. That's called Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. That's so when we call the physicians, and even when we talk to each other, we're speaking in a structured format to keep it efficient so that we don't forget anything. The third prong of PBM is optimizing coagulation. When developing protocols, we use what's called evidence-based practice. You've seen quite a bit up here so far. For example, what's in the literature? Beth Black mentioned the um, Hemoglobin no longer is the trigger point for giving a unit of blood 10, 9, or even 8 grams per deciliter. Now we'll even consider down to 7. Yes, you heard it here, 7.0, if the patient is um, non-symptomatic or not actively losing blood. So when it comes to best practices, nurses have to consider how fast do we deliver a blood product. We know if we give it too quick, we can put a patient into fluid volume overload and cause congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. Rapid response teams are available in case of an emergency. When your nurse has the objective data and sometimes that intuition that something's not right, the nurse can call in the troops for backup. Our nurses know and monitor the risks of blood products. You've seen some already, and here's just a few more. As you can see, in healthcare, we use a lot of abbreviations. Looking at this list, this is what we want to avoid. It's a group of hospital-acquired complications. That's an actual term, hospital-acquired complications. And we avoid this because we know it causes increased mortality and increased lengths of stay. When I look at this list, one impact of giving blood that most don't realize, and it's not even on the list, is that giving a unit of blood actually reduces the bone marrow's ability to produce more erythropoietin to produce red blood cells in the first place. So who are we helping? Did I mention let's stop the madness? Hey, while the patient blood pro pro management program does not tell us not to give blood when blood is needed, it does help us weigh the risk versus benefit ratio. 
As you can see in this slide, the risks are many, and we take giving blood very seriously. In fact, in nursing school, we were taught blood is a liquid organ. You heard Dr. De uh, uh, Dr. Beck explain that chemistry of carrying oxygen, get, getting rid of the body's wastes. As such, giving blood is literally giving an organ transplant. The fourth prong of managing anemia, here's where we use informatics to help, and that's our electronic health records to warn healthcare providers if a patient's in danger. The use of technology helps us identify risk factors that are piling up by evaluating the vital signs and assessment data. While these computerized warning systems still require a human being to weed out false alarms, they do help in early identification and treatment. Since each unit of blood carries risks, we use a restrictive threshold now of 7 to 8.0 grams per deciliter in most of our patients in the hospital that are stable. Single unit transfusions are important. For many years, we considered why. Heck, if we're given one, let's just give two. Um, now, we know that single unit is the standard. And in fact, we use these posters throughout our hospital on the campaign of why use two when one will do. This helps get the word out to our staff. Critical thinking or clinical reasoning is used to pick up on symptomatic anemia. Critical thinking skills by the nurse helps them differentiate what's considered a critical value by definition to what's really critical and going on with the patient. When it comes to clinical, clinical reasoning and explaining the nurse's role in patient blood management, I like to use this picture. When you look at this picture, what's happening? What do you see? What is the nurse doing? I see a critical care nurse at the bedside of an obviously ill patient, given the monitoring equipment, the ventilator, the number of intravenous lines. On the surface, it doesn't appear as if the nurse is doing much. This is what family members might think if they enter the room. But in the quiet stillness, many things may be happening. This nurse may be reading the monitors for heart rate and heart rhythm, mean arterial pressure, oxygen saturation levels. A quick look would tell them the patient's urine output, and a quick touch would reveal whether a patient's skin is cool and clammy or warm and dry. He could also be looking for facial grimacing or biting on the breathing tube, clues that sedation might be inadequate. Florence Nightingale recognized the importance of watchfulness or vigilance nearly 200 years ago when she taught the skill of surveillance, an underrecognized but fundamental nursing skill, fundamental, and that is of surveillance. It's that quiet evaluation tasks like reading monitors, noticing a patient's facial expressions that are as critical as more complex responsibilities. But these are difficult skills for the nurses to quantify. We certainly can't bill insurance for this service. This is why nursing is considered a science and an art. A science because our interventions are based on evidence and research, but an art because of how we deliver the science of nursing care. This is an opportune year for the American Nurses Association as this is the year of the advocacy. And you can see our Nurses Week theme this year was to inspire, innovate, and influence. And this sums up what nurses do for patients and the nursing profession along with the healthcare system. Oh, if Florence Nightingale could see us now, what would she say? Well, I think she'd be pleased how far we've come as a profession. Although nursing in her time wasn't viewed as, uh, was viewed as a less desirable occupation, Nightingale knew so, it was so much more. And I agree with her when she coined the term Nursing is an art and a science. When it comes to blood, every drop is precious, and our patients are precious to us. Because we care, let's continue to share best practices in patient blood management. So again, for the nurses in the audience, I am so glad we're offering continuing nursing education units. Don't forget, return your evaluation in the box in the lobby on your way out. And if you notice, I use a lot of Florence Nightingale quotes in my slides. Well, it's a fact, Florence Nightingale had a good friend named Selena Bracebridge, and I tell the students, if you don't believe me, Google it, it's the same spelling. And as such, my friend, Florence Nightingale, is in the lobby to help me pass out certificates with the, for the nurses in the audience. So if you get a chance, stop by and say hi to Florence. And with that, I thank you. You know, you have it by regional. They do a cut above on just about everything that we try here. 
And when we implemented the patient blood management program here, ever since then we've seen a steady decline across all specialties, hospitals, procedures, we've seen just a decline in the amount and the rate of the products that we're transfusing here. So if there's one thing that I can say, it's Yavapai Regional Medical Center gets behind the science. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's welcome back Dale Black and a very special guest, Anthony Caballero. Well, friends, audience members, this uh, is a buddy of mine now for the last year. A year ago, he was here, and he had a rather complex uh, surgery. Um, he lives in Tucson, and so, Anthony, I, you, you said you're willing to tell us a bit of your story in an abbreviated fashion. So did you come up to uh, Prescott seeking medical care? Is that how that happened? No, not at all. Um, Actually, a friend of mine, he was um, building a house for his sister down in Dewey, not just not I far see. from Prescott Valley. And so uh, I had uh, come up, he asked me to come up and, um, and help him do the stem wall. And uh, so I had come up on um, a Monday morning and my son came to help me. And it was a two-day job, so I told my son, uh, we have to get at least little more than 50% done the first day so that we could finish it off uh, on the second day. So we go back to my friend's house. His wife made us dinner, and uh, her brother-in-law was there as well. So we had dinner, and after dinner, for some reason, she, she said that my son had a funny cough. So she brought out her um, cuff. Blood pressure cuff? Blood pressure cuff, and she started taking everybody's blood pressure. And so it came around to me, and um, after she did that, she said, your heart rate is 140. And I'm like, well, what's normal? And they, they, said, uh, they said like 70. So her brother-in-law tells me, you know, I have a feeling that tomorrow you're probably just going to be pointing to your son, do this and do that. And in my head, I'm thinking, um, I don't know what this guy's talking about. So he ends up leaving, we uh, watch a little TV, we go to bed, go to bed at 10 o'clock. So from 10 o'clock to midnight, I was moving every which way. I couldn't go to sleep and it was getting more difficult to breathe. So finally, in my stubbornness, I finally at midnight go and wake up my son and I says, I think we gotta go to the hospital. So that's how I ended up here. Gotcha. So the, your, your sister, or the, the friend, the wife, she didn't bring the blood pressure cuff out because of the way you looked at dinner. No. No. Uh, but you have been going to doctors all your life, uh, right? <laughs> I think that was a chuckle from my wife. No, I, I, <laughs> I, think, um, I think the last time I was at a doctor, I cut myself right here like 12 years, when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. I had a few stitches, but... That's probably the last time I've been to a doctor. So 45 years, one time. That's amazing. Um, now, if um, let's just pretend that you had this experience um, back home in Tucson, and this is for the males in our audience, what would have been your course of action? You're, you decided you had to go to the hospital here, but if you'd been home, what might you have done? So what had happened, um, just backing up a little bit, was... Um, I had promised uh, my friend Joe that I would be here Monday morning to start the job. Well, Sunday, uh, that was really the first time I really wasn't feeling good, and I learned later I was in AFib. So uh, I, some friends had asked us to go to lunch, and I, I, I declined, and I went home and actually went to sleep for four hours. So when I got up, my wife is saying, call him and cancel. You're not feeling good. And I says, no, I'm still pretty good now. So we ended up leaving at 3 in the morning and um, got here. And so then that's what happened. We ended up going to, they took us to the hospital at uh, Prescott Valley. Right. 
And while we were there, we, we got there about midnight or a little after, 1230 or so. And um, my son wanted to call my wife, and I'm like, why are you going to make her drive in the middle of the night? Just wait till the morning. So uh, they get me stabilized when her and my daughter showed up in the morning. Then they were transferring me to Prescott Hospital. And in the hospital at that time is when, uh, that's when we first um, seen the benefits of this patient blood management because uh, she got a call from you and just letting her know that, hey, we got everything under control and uh, everything's going to work out all right. So uh, that was really comforting at that time. So, Anthony, what made your case more complex than the average? Um, let me back up because I, I didn't really ask, answer your other question because oh, okay. you said um, about for the men here. Well, is that's that, right. You didn't answer that question. <laughs> is uh, so I think I'm probably a, probably like most men here. We just don't like going to the doctors. And um, if I was back home instead of being here, I probably would have just said, you know what, let me go take another sleep. But it might have been a lot longer sleep than I wanted to that time. <laughs> So it was beneficial to come here. Uh, it all worked out. Um, now, the set, this other question was what? Well, it had, I didn't even know what it was. Uh, let's see. <laughs> what made your case more complex? Oh, so I, um, for personal reasons, not wanting to take blood. Um, and I had a few things that I think you're going to explain a little bit, right? Yeah, if, if you want me to, I can do this with yeah. your permission. Yes. So I went over this with Dr. Tibby beforehand so I could pronounce the words correctly. Um, well, you had an aortic valve stenosis, a dilated, you had a condition of dilated cardiomyopathy. You had significant rhythm problems, a dilated aortic root, which is the base of the aorta, and then the operation, which took place on October 2nd of last year. Uh, Dr. Tibby did an aortic valve replacement you had a coronary artery bypass graft. You, he repaired the aorta. And he did all these things. It took about four hours, I recall. Um, but we asked him why. Why did you do it all? And he said it's because you were a patient that did not want to bring in any of the four major components of, of blood. And so he decided that it would be best to take care of all your needs all at once rather than a, take care of you a year later. It would, you're not a good candidate for that. So he did it all, the one, all at once. So let me ask you a question then. When you met Dr. Tibby and the staff and you told them about your situation, how were you treated? Like a weirdo? Like uh, somebody who is kooky and crazy? How did they treat you? No, not at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I have a friend that was up visiting from, from Tucson and he deals with a lot of, kind of like what you do, deals with a lot of the hospitals back there too. And uh, he told me, he says, uh, Anthony he says, cause he knows how I feel about being at the hospital and stuff. He says, uh, don't get used to the way you're treated here because you probably won't find that back there. So no, I was treated very well. Very good. Well, one last comment. I, I enjoyed what you had said here when you had told me this story once before. So when you were about to go into surgery and you're with Dr. Tibby, and you asked the question that almost everybody asks, what was that question? Well, prior, um, we were kind of hearing just, uh, they were trying to figure out what they were gonna do because Dr. Tibby actually wasn't in town at the time. And um, the, it was pretty, <laughs> pretty bleak at times. My family was uh, pretty distraught about some of the things we're hearing about uh, the odds of me even surviving this. So if, naturally when Dr. Tibby came in, uh, that was the very first thing that we asked was, so was what are the odds uh, for coming through on this? And he very, very, uh, just he was very sure about himself and he says, you know, in any surgery like this, uh, it's probably, you know, 10%. He says, but, uh, but don't worry, he says, we're gonna go in guns a-blazing. How'd that make you feel? Gave me what I needed and my family. Fantastic. So in retrospect, what advice would you give to people about 
seeing doctors before the age of uh, 58. <laughs> Anything you might add to that? <laughs> yeah, wake up from the nap and go to the doctor, I guess, right? right? right. Anthony, thank you very much. Thank All you. Right. I believe the physicians and healthcare providers in our area are now seeing that the treatment for anemia should start initially with oral iron, advancing to IV iron, and as a last resort, going with the blood transfusion. Blood transfusions have a much higher risk as far as retention of iron in your organs, which will cause organ failure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Dr. Tibby, who will moderate a panel discussion with our experts. Thank you very much. And while our experts take a seat, once again, I want to thank uh, Dale Black and Beth Black, who run the Patient Blood Management Program at YRMC, and have really been the ones who have um, kept everything going. So thank you. I I also want to uh, uh, I want you all to realize that here at YRMC in tiny town of Prescott, we have two. We have many great physicians, but Dr. Muala, who came about a year and a half ago, who has brought some really leading edge technology. And I'd like to have Dr. George Gellert stand up. Uh, so I used, I used to work with Dr. Gellert maybe 20 years ago in, um, in uh, Phoenix at uh, Banner Good Sam, and we did plenty of wonderful cases together. And 10, 11 years ago, I came up to uh, uh, Prescott to uh, start the program here. It was very sad to leave uh, George, but oh, I'd say about six months ago, George asked Sundos and I to get together in Phoenix, and we got together and uh, said, you know what? I, I really want to work with people that I enjoy working with, and he was talking about Dr. Muala. Dr. George Gellert is truly, I'm not, this is not, you can look it up in truly one, one of, if not the, the world expert on doing these cases with echocardiography, uh, these interventional cases that will save patients from the likes of me. So uh, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Gellert here once every week or two and Dr. Muala. Anyway, so uh, I want to thank everybody for giving great talks. Um, and we have polled some questions. And I know we're running a little uh, uh, late on time, but um, I think it's uh, been a worthwhile program. So we had polled some questions from uh, from people who were attending tonight. And um, I'm going to ans ask these to our experts. And um, it, we may have time for questions from the audience if you so desire. So one of the first questions, uh, and I'd uh, uh, like to uh, pose it to uh, um, Diane, uh, Diane Drexler, our CNO. Um, I've heard the re recommendation to have my blood work done yearly in order to address issues such as anemia early. But as a Medicare patient, I understand that blood work done as part of an annual checkup is not covered. What recommendations do you have for me? Well, uh, it's important for patients to know the symptoms of anemia, such as headaches, shortness of breath, craving ice, restless legs, cold toes and fingers, pale skin, fast heartbeat, dizziness, and definitely to share these uh, symptoms with your uh, physician. Your phys physician would then order the diagnostic blood work, which would be covered by Medicare and most other insurances. Thank you. Another question is, if we can tell DNA by reading the blood, 
And if we can get various diseases from contaminated blood, then what is the possibility that another person's DNA is mixed with our DNA and we could take on their attributes? Uh, let's have uh, Beth to answer this. Well, there, there were some interesting studies done where a significant number of World War II survivors who'd received whole blood in the field um, decades later still had other people's DNA in their bodies. And we really just don't know what the implications of that are, um, other than it must be fun for Ancestry.com is what I'm thinking. <laughs> but, but what we do know is that DNA is carried in the white cells um, the leukocytes, because they have a nucleus, and yet 80% of red blood cells in the United States are washed or leuco-reduced. So that certainly does uh, reduce the transmission of cell-borne viruses, but also would, along with that, reduce DNA transmission, and we just really don't know what that would mean if someone did have DNA from another person in them. Thank you. Um, Jeannie Du is our Director of Surgical Services, and uh, I'm going to pick this question for her. Uh, Jeannie, what patient blood management options are available at YRMC for patients who do not want to utilize blood fractions? Well, I think that there's a lot more options, and that's happening more often than you, than you might think. Um, our surgeons, our hospitalists, our ED physicians are all much more in tune to meeting those patient wishes. Um, one of the things I thought of that has just happened recently, kind of along what, what Selena was mentioning with the EMR, is we've taken our um, patient, uh, our, our order sets that live in the EMR, and we've really put some tight criteria around the practitioners being able to order blood. So it really is raising their awareness of other alternatives, other medications that they can, can give instead of blood. Um, I think that um, one of the big things that came up tonight was just the ability to have a multidisciplinary conference to really look at, all, at what are all the options for the different types of treatments that we can do for patients. And I've uh, witnessed that every week of the surgeons, the cardiac interventionalists really talking about what is the best approach for the patient and does it have to be fully invasive or can it be a minimally invasive approach? Um, some of the other things in surgery, uh, just doing more meticulous approaches to reduce blood loss in surgery. I've been a nurse for a long time and you know it was nothing 35 years ago for everybody to have a fairly significant uh, estimated blood loss at the end of a case um, on cases that were simple elective surgeries. And today, even in complex surgery, any, any significant blood loss is, is, is really um, unusual, and we really work hard to reduce that. We can use Cell Saver to take blood from the field and return that to the patient. Um, we can do a better job by uh, giving transexemic acid, or TXA, um, earlier to help. Um, uh, fi uh, it's a synthetic antifibrinolytic that we can give to patients. Um, we have ethropoietin, which is another treatment. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's probably familiar with getting iron if you have anemia. So there are a lot of alternatives. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Dale, as YRMC I didn't know that you were going to ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> go What's ahead. that? <laughs> this is on purpose, but go ahead. As YRMC has embraced blood management, why are there still so many blood drives? I hate that question. <laughs> um, it's because, uh, in fact, it is believed and understood that in some cases, blood saves lives. It came for World War II, and I'm not, I'm not arguing that fact, uh, that the use of blood does save lives. But we know that the effect of all the blood drive, if you go back to World War II, which was covered, I think, in your part, uh, be a hero, give blood. And that was because blood was being given on the, on the battlefield. Those doctors and surgeons who were there when the war was over came to the U.S. and they brought that with them. And so it has been a tradition. It has been carried on. So yes, uh, it is still viewed 
uh, by, the, by the vast majority of doctors as, in some cases, the only thing to do. So that's why there are blood drives. Thank you. Um, Dr. Muala, when will I will no longer be needed? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, honestly, I don't really know if this ever uh, going to happen. Um, uh, as much as there is this uh, territorial conflict over the years, I think, uh, uh, over who does what, um, I, I think the best thing that came out of this is the, as we talked about, the multidisciplinary heart team or whatever subspecialty, like you have it in the transplant arena, you have it in the oncology arena, uh, where you have what's called the tumor board. They sit down and discuss what is the best way to manage this patient. So the, the pathology, I know we just gave a quick glimpse of these various technologies available. That does not fit every patient. There are patients who have all these little pathologies we spoke earlier, patients who have valves that are bicuspid. Uh, they have aortopathies and their aortas dilate. And uh, we currently don't have um, a way to deal with that. So uh, the technology is going to evolve uh, to, to try to answer that, but I don't know if this is something that would be completely erased. More importantly than that is we can also have a lot of um, complications that happens during these procedures. The calcium can crack while we are doing any of these procedures. And then um, we will definitely need your services. So <laughs> I can't have you out of business. <laughs> uh, thankfully, we haven't needed it. But uh, uh, you, you, you know, we, we, we can present a, such a wonderful, rosy picture of what's available, which is true. But bad things happen. These are sick patient populations. So I, I truly, really, to, to my enjoyment, compared to when I was in training 20 years ago, when cardiologists and surgeons didn't want to talk to each other. Uh, and this is a very, very um, uh, exciting, and it serves one purpose, the patient. That's the most important part. So. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we are f a few minutes over our, does anybody in the audience have any questions they would like to ask the team? Sir. Okay, uh, the question, in case you haven't heard, is the SYRMC uh, really uh, is playing a role to improve patient blood management, to further patient blood management. What's it like around the rest of the country? Well, I can tell you that I've been doing patient blood management for at least 15 to 20 years, and I kind of joke in that uh, I started doing it because I had just gotten out of residency and somebody came up to me, asked me that wouldn't take blood for religious reasons and asked if I would operate on them and I said sure uh, because he had been to several other cardiac surgeons that wouldn't operate and you know m the, the thing is is that I said sure because I needed the business and then I had to, <laughs> and I had to and then I had to think well how am I going to operate on this patient safely without giving blood so it was relatively serendipitous for me to get into patient blood management, but right around that time, more and more uh, information and research was being done, which showed that there, that there, were, there may be and there were benefits in applying patient blood management to all patients. And um, that's when I got into it and I realized that, you know, after doing about 100 patients without blood, that they were in fact doing better than patients that I would give blood to. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, I would say patient blood management has really spread around the country. Some things, paradigm shifts are sometimes very difficult uh, to get traction, uh, but it is getting traction now. We have societies that, that look very carefully at patient blood management. If you have any questions or you wanna learn more about it, just go to sabm.org 
societyadvancementbloodmanagement.org, sabm.org, and you can find a tremendous amount of material there. So there are, at, uh, of the hospitals around the country, about 10 to 15 percent of, pa uh, of hospitals have actual patient blood, ma blood management departments and focus on blood, patient blood management. Nevertheless, throughout the country, in all hospitals, blood utilization is being looked at very carefully, not only by hospitals, but by regulatory agencies, and not only for patient outcomes, uh, but for, unfortunately or unfortunately, financial implications, okay? Pa uh, Yavapai Regional Medical Center is the only SABM PBM approved program in the state of Arizona. Is it, does that answer your question? Can I, can I comment, Doctor, to be on that? Just uh, being younger than you are, so I have to <laughs> <laughs> remind you of that. <laughs> to your question, when I was in medical school 25 years ago, there was no education whatsoever on that. And, and uh, we were trained with the older mentality. As you said, you lose blood, you replace it. That's, uh, that's the key. Um, the, it is wonderful now that this is becoming a curriculum in most of the medical schools to educate the new generation. So I think it's gonna be a, a generational shift that this is something to be seriously considered. Um, and what are some of the methods that we can reduce uh, the blood loss? So just to, sorry, go ahead. Anything away tonight, ask them, what are my alternatives to a blood product? There are choices, you just have to ask. Be persistent. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Dr. Moala. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Why? Sure. Uh, the question was where am I from and where I did my training? So um, I was born in Tunisia. It used to be a French colony. My parents moved to the United States when I was six months old. I grew up in Memphis for the first six years of my life. How I got there, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, then I uh, grew up in New York City and uh, did my training in uh, University of Pittsburgh and University of Rochester. Uh, did uh, training with a doctor named Carpentier, Dr. Carpentier in Paris, France, and uh, started in Phoenix in uh, 1989 and have been here ever since, so Phoenix in Arizona. Okay. <laughs> Do you want everybody else's? Uh... <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the question, uh, the question, did you hear the question? Part of it, I didn't hear. So I, I heard, I think part of it, but uh, you asked basically uh, the, for the physicians placing cardiac devices, how many years of training have they had or, or do you need to have to? Oh. Okay, how many years? Very, very good question. So yeah, there are two parts to this question. You're asking about requirement, you're asking what's ha available here. Uh, basically, I've been out of training. My, my education took 22 years in total from college until I finished fellowship 11 years ago. So I've been out in practice for 11 years. Um, and I have dedicated training just into structure. I spent a whole year, that's all I did practically. Uh, but it's been, I've been in practice for 11 years. As you know, Dr. Tibi has been in practice for many years and we also have another cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Torres, I don't know, he's been 10 years, roughly uh, eight, eight, 10? Yeah, eight years. Something like that. So uh, your, the, the most important of that question is the requirement of this training. So what Medicare and the FDA, when they allowed a lot of these procedures to come on board, they're very, very strict criteria as to who's allowed to implant these devices and who's not. And that's the more important question. So the hospital has to qualify by the number of heart surgeries that they do. 
So that's number one. And that speaks to the experience that Dr. Tibby has really done in this place for, for many years. Um, subsequently, um, the, you have to have elements of the team. You have to have imaging, certain anesthesia, certain um, equipment, uh, what we call hybrid OR, and um, uh, uh, that the hospital had to put a lot of effort to invest to put on part. Then every, the, the, the implanters, Medicare and um, FDA requires that a surgeon and interventional cardiologist are present for the procedure, for the TAVR. Um, they, they both have to be present for the procedure. And that's the beauty of this heart team, because we're trying to discuss what the best option uh, for that patient. They, uh, uh, because in the United States they are relatively new, there's only um, 11 formal designated structural fellowship currently available in the United States. So I'm sure compared to when I finished 11 years ago, because I had to get out of practice, do a separate year, just uniquely for that, because it wasn't available when I was in training. Um, I'm sure in 20 years, it's gonna be part of every day's training for all the fellows that are coming. So it's highly regulated um, and set criteria set by the societies on, on the, the experience and the hospital and the team. Yes. He did what again? Uh, can you say that again? Oh, wonderful. Wow, great. I think we have one more question. If anybody's got a question, sir. So the question is, if somebody's already had a tissue valve, and tissue valves will last typically 12, 14 years, plus or minus, uh, if this fails, do they have to have another reoperation, or are they a candidate for uh, transcatheter valves? Um, uh, so the answer to your question, yes, they are candidate. But again, um, by FDA criteria and CMS criteria, uh, to qualify to get the device in the United States, you have to be an intermediate or a high-risk surgical candidate, meaning even if you wish to, um, unless you have an unlimited funds that you, uh, you wish to go to Canada or Germany to get it done in the United States, cannot place it unless you have to be declared an intermediate or a high-risk surgical candidate by the heart team. Probably, I suspect in the next year or so, this might change as that uh, newer trial is gonna be presented in March, which will probably change the guideline, but as it stands, you have to fulfill certain surgical criteria. The things that Dr. Mualla is doing and we're doing is, is, is progressing at an extremely rapid rate, even in the United States. Some of the things, uh, I mean, within Within the next year or two, Dr. Mwala will be involved with mitral valve technology, replacing the mitral valve percutaneously, tricuspid valve uh, technology. So things will change um, very quickly. All right. Um, I wanted to, first of all, actually, I want to thank uh, you all for coming here. The fact that we have a community that is as interested in spending two plus hours uh, listening to us talk and uh, has and, and the hospital and the uh, healthcare community here has the community that supports us is very, very important. I think it says a lot for our area, our hospital and our community. And secondly, uh, I don't wanna let this go by without thanking Yavapai Regional Medical Center and the administration, Dr. Er, John Amos, our CEO, and Diane Drexler, our CNO, for understanding the importance of connecting with the community and connecting patient blood management to the community and supporting, you know, all the, the, the venue and the appetizers and so forth and believing in our, our medical care here. So uh, please take that back to John. Welcome to one of the
wrap it up. If you want to wrap it up. We, once again, I want to thank all of you. Uh, many of you have come from distant locations, from the Valley and from, Fla from Flagstaff, I see you. And um, that's testimony to your interest in this science. And just be assured that uh, Yavapai Regional Medical Center and its PBM program is a resource designed for you. It's all about you. Uh, your outcomes, your health, your happiness, uh, that is our goal, that's our only goal to use good science, abide by your wishes, and uh, produce happiness and good outcomes in your family. So once again, thank you for showing support for an important and for some people boring subject. But you folks see the value of it and we appreciate you. <laughs> thank you, drive home safely.